Excalibur, our beloved poster boy, the face of Warframe, the very first starter, the very first character. Everywhere you go, Excalibur is there, on the website, on the forums, on YouTube videos like this one. Hell, even on the wiki, his giant head is right there, staring you down. Excalibur is the face of this beloved legendary free-to-play game. Without Excalibur, Warframe wouldn't even be a thing. Excalibur gave birth to this wonderful game that we can all enjoy, or complain about, or both. But it's very obvious as to who Excalibur is. His design is so iconic that anyone who doesn't even play Warframe will understand that this is Excalibur from Warframe. He's that popular. To some, Excalibur may be an icon, and for many others, he may be the very first Warframe. I mean, he is a starter after all, and the very first starter you get to see before selecting Volt or Mag. Even in the new cinematic trailer, Excalibur is shown first doing his exalted shenanigans. But where did Excalibur even come from? And how did this sword-themed character rise to fame and popularity? And more importantly, why was Excalibur chosen as the first? To answer this question, we have to dig deep into history. In fact, Excalibur's history goes as far back as before Warframe was even a thing. That's right, for you very keen viewers out there, we're talking about Dark Sector, Warframe's predecessor made by Digital Extremes. Dark Sector is a third-person action shooter developed by DE and released on the Xbox 360, PlayStation 3, and PC. I mean, even looking at the front cover, it's quite obvious. A glaive? A character that is named Hayden Tano and resembles almost identical to the protoskin? A story oriented around the Technocyte virus? Our main character also wears the conveniently named Excalibur suit, and there is an almost lotus-like icon on the promotional material. Hmm, what a coincidence. Dark Sector was an interesting game. When looking back at it today, it seems a lot of Warframe's fundamental systems in the original beta derived heavily off of Dark Sector. The game was originally proposed as a follow-up to the critically acclaimed Unreal Tournament made by DE and Epic Games. The game was actually announced way back in February of 2000. Unfortunately, Dark Sector went completely dark for several years due to drastic changes and new design decisions. And we went around and pitched it, and uh, this was bef this was kind of like, kind of when Halo was sort of a thing starting to emerge. But every publisher said no one likes sci-fi and they won't sell consistently every time. Um, <clears throat> we, uh, you know, space is uh, space is lame. Uh, space is, and then insert you know insert politically incorrect term. So uh, as that runway was running out and I was getting desperate and we were getting chain yanked by publishers. You know, one publisher said, well, we don't like the hero, he's too feminine, can he have an eye patch? Like literally crazy things like that. Okay. So our, I would go to, to who, one of the most talented artists in the video game industry, Mike Brennan, I'd say, can you give him a ragged ear and an eye patch? <laughs> right? And I'm asking him, you know, not be, I felt like a, a heel because I had to live between the artists and, you know, trying to get it signed, yeah. right? And so he would send me back something that's just actually absolutely preposterous. But it was getting so close to signing, but just wasn't. And it was right. dragging on and dragging on. So I did a, we did a pivot. We said, oh, it's going to be, okay, those sci-fi stuff, fine. Okay, so it's going to be more like Resident Evil than it is going to be like, uh, you know, Dark Crystal in mm -hmm. space. So we kind of made these compromises in order to land the deal, and we did. Right. But all those wacky sci-fi ideas remained lurking. Unfortunately, publishers at the time did not like the original sci-fi feel and aesthetic Dark Sector was supposed to have. Hence, during the initial reveal, the game looked very different compared to the release. Despite all the drastic changes to the character, game, and theme, there's one thing DE did keep, and that was the name, Hayden Tenno and it's the name they stuck with going forward. Dark Sector received very mixed reviews. The gameplay was generally clunky and slow. The glaive mechanic, while interesting and unique on paper, felt really sloppy. Ammo was scarce, so for the most part, players had to utilize the glaive, which was slow compared to the other gameplay elements. Unfortunately, the game was banned in Australia because the game had excessive violence with its finisher moves. Dark Sector, while not a hit success, at least gave possibility of a future sequel. When asked about it back in 2008, Steven Sinclair of Digital Extreme stated that there was nothing definitive planned, but commented that he would love to do one. 
and that Dark Sector only scratched the surface of the character and weapon's potential. And in reality, Dark Sector did only scratch the surface. Fast forward another 4 years and we get early insights into the new free to play Warframe. When understanding the development process of Warframe, it's important to realize that this was Steven's chance to make something new. Warframe is his game, it was his idea, a chance to give us a sequel that he wanted to all those years prior. While Dark Sector may not have been successful, it at least gave way into Warframe. <laughs> too bad it's space. I remember we crunched for two months to, we literally made a game demo in two months with a very small group of people, one artist, one level designer, a couple programmers. Um, and we made uh, what was the Warframe demo. And we, we probably have video footage that Dave can give you of it. And we rented a suite in the Hilton, mm -hmm. and we had the, most, the largest free-to-play publishers in the world, the richest. You know, I don't need to name them, but you can just, like, Google, <laughs> who's the richest? Here they come. And they walked in, and they said, ah, oh, this is great. I can't believe this. I'm, what an exciting meeting. I'm so good. And it slow motion, and the record needle scratch because it was sci-fi. Right. And they just walked in. The sad reality is that Warframe was an idea that publishers did not like. You see, when looking back at the release of Dark Sector, its tone, theme, and general gameplay was not set in the far distant future like originally planned. And as a result of the constant changes in development, the game ended up as a very bare bones action shooter that didn't feel any different in the market at the time. Dark Sector became very safe. The market was already oversaturated with a bunch of these gritty shooters, and not many games really tried to innovate or break boundaries with new settings and themes. It was just all very safe. But fast forward 5 years later, and all of a sudden, everyone is on the sci-fi craze. But the real question we're asking here is, why Excalibur? Why was Excalibur chosen? The simple answer is, well, Warframe could be seen as a sequel to Dark Sector and the sequel to Hayden Tenno. When looking at the two designs, it's very clear that Excalibur derives heavily off of the proto-Excalibur suit. I mean, their names are literally the same. The complicated answer on the other hand is, well, they took the original concepts and pitch of Dark Sector before it was Resident Evilified and used these ideas into creating the early Warframe, and this included the original Excalibur suit design that they had created. And due to the time constraints, DE didn't have the opportunity or time to compromise with free-to-play publishers. Not that they wanted to anyways, because now they had a clear vision for Warframe. And thus, on October 25th of 2012, Excalibur alongside the vanilla release was born. Excalibur was... pretty basic. He had four abilities, and every Warframe after Excalibur followed this rule. Old Excalibur's first ability was Slash Dash. Casting the ability will lock Excalibur in place and fire him across a straight line, and any enemy caught in the range would get sliced. Radio Blind functions almost the same as it does today. Excalibur raises his sword, or weapon, because the Exalted Blade did not exist back then, and channels his strength to create a blinding light that stunned and blinded enemies within range. Excalibur's third ability is Radiant. Oh, that's right. Exalted Blade was not a thing, and Excalibur had a completely different ability. Super Jump. Yeah, if that sounded useless, trust me, it was. Excalibur channels his might and lunges into the air really high. I mean, the ability wasn't that bad considering there was any synergies with Super Jump and Penta, but still, when players figured out that you could slide attack to gain momentum, Super Jump just became useless. And lastly, Excalibur's ultimate, Radial Javelin. Excalibur slams the ground and launches out blades that target enemies and pierce them, dealing high damage in a wide radius. The blades were actually not javelins that targeted enemies, but actually came out of Excalibur's body onto nearby mobs. Pretty standard stuff, if we're gonna be honest. Due to the limited sandbox and parkour system, Excalibur, despite being very simplistic in nature, got the job done, and for a while, he remained one of the most useful frames, because he was one of the very few frames in the game, the others being Rhino, Mag, Loki, Ash, Trinity, Volt, and Ember. Yeah, that was it. The game only had 8 total characters to choose from. Because of this, Excalibur remained pretty popular. 
Part of the reason was also because before the very first tutorial, Excalibur was the only frame that was just given to players. It wasn't until a bit later on when New Tunnel had the choice to pick between Excalibur, Loki, or Mag. Obviously, later in January, a new batch of frames were introduced, such as Frost and Nyx, but throughout most of the closed beta, the roster was limited in selection. However, despite the limited selection roster throughout the years, Excalibur remained the same while other frames got changes and buffs and tweaks. Because of this, Excalibur started to get outclassed. Rhino was very popular because he could phase tank enemies easily and provide boosts that buffed allies. People figured out that Mag could do a ton of damage against Corpus enemies, and with Frost's introduction, he simply outclassed Excalibur in many departments. And Ember was also pretty busted around this time, so... Yeah, not looking good for our swordsman. There isn't a whole lot to say really because Excalibur just remained the way he did for a while until update 15. Oh. Okay, okay, I guess we should talk about that. So, Excalibur was very special because Excalibur kickstarted the now known Prime Access. Well, technically that was Ember, but this video is about our boy Excal, so I'll just leave it at that. During the very early closed betas, DE was still looking for publishers to try and give them a much needed cash injection. Along with exclusive equipment, forum badges, Warframe sigils, and keys to the upcoming beta. The team had never sold in-game items before, so they had no idea if anyone was going to buy them. I can, I can kind of like put my finger on the most optimistic I've, I'd felt, which was when we started our Founders program, which was sort of our own Kickstarter version of the game, which was basically these you can become a founder of Warframe, and that means that you'll sort of have meant it was successful if it turns out to be that way. And I remember watching um, real time as the first Grandmaster founder purchase came through, and at that point, that was someone spending $250 to support Warframe for what it was at the time. That was like the moment when I realized people will like people care about this game right. as much as us. Warframe is a game that many consider to be fair free to play, but that wasn't always the case. As the game moved into closed beta, it had a supercharge system that allowed players to double the capacity of their gear. But there was no in-game way of unlocking this system. It was only available if you used real-world cash to unlock it, meaning those who were willing to spend could effectively be double the power of those who weren't. The reason I don't like the Warframe here leveling up is if I go into this, uh, there's nothing else to do because I need this upgrade, Orican Reactor, and without it, I can't take this Warframe any further. Before this point in time, Warframe actually had a very pay to win system, believe it or not. The only way to supercharge your Warframes was by spending real money. Nowadays, you can do this by using a reactor or catalyst, which there are plenty of ways of obtaining it for free. But back then, there was no way to supercharge your Warframe for free. Despite this, DE still decided to release the Founders program as a form of a Kickstarter so Warframe could get its money. But soon enough, over the next few months and into early 2013, with the introduction of the Founders program as well as updates, the microtransactions did get better, and they ended up removing many pay to win elements and mechanics. The Founders program kickstarted and players could now choose to purchase Excalibur Prime or buy higher tier bundles which gave players Excalibur Prime and his new Prime weapons, the Leto Prime and Skana Prime. The Founders program also had two tiers, called Master and Grandmaster, which gave players access to the Design Council chat, as well as Grandmasters having access to a solar landmark, which can now be seen in the relay. Since the game was in its closed beta state, it means that players needed a key to access and play the game. However, if a new player did not have a key, they would gain instant access to the game if they purchased a Founders package. In terms of Excalibur Prime himself, outside of his design, he was identical to the original. I think it was a very smart move to keep Excalibur Prime similar to the base despite having small changes in stats. Normal players could still enjoy the game without feeling ripped off because other players dumped 100 plus dollars. And to this day, Primes while now having higher stat upgrades still function identical to the base having the same abilities and ability stats. And with the introduction of the Resurgence program, players had a very streamlined format of obtaining older Primes. When looking back at the Founders pack, it was quite expensive compared to the normal Prime Access nowadays, and it was a huge risk. Let's be honest, Warframe was just not a great game back then. 
But during the closed beta, there were so many bugs, glitches, and issues with the gameplay. There was a huge lack of content as well as a limited roster of characters and weapons. The fact that DE released this program a mere two months after the initial vanilla launch shows how desperate they were to get the funding to continue to build Warframe. But thankfully, the Founders program did end up raising a little over $3 million, which was just enough to keep Warframe alive and the lights on at night. But because of the Founders pack, DE realized that they could continue this program in a more streamlined format, now known as Prime Access Program, where every 90 days a new Prime Warframe would release and players could buy it. Obviously as a free-to-play game this is normal, but what separated Warframe from other free-to-plays at the time was that DE didn't rob the player of their money. In fact, Warframe gave players a free choice to grind for these primes through in-game activities. Obviously, buying them outright was faster, but for many players, shelving out 50 to 100 bucks every 3 months is not cheap. And even with the old Void Key system, farming for Prime Warframes is still manageable, and it wasn't as bad as other infamous South Asian-based MMOs. I mean, yes, of course, it was frustrating having to farm certain parts in endless rotations, but with the introduction of the trading system, the free-to-win aspect kept growing and growing. Now, obviously, the Founders Pack wasn't the only reason as to why Warframe was allowed to become so successful. A lot of Founders are actually inactive or have quit. Only a small fraction of Founders still play to this day, but they aren't all gone. The players themselves had to put their trust and faith into Warframe. Having that extra 3 million was nice, but DE had a lot of work to do, a lot of updates to complete and ship out. Warframe needed to continue building. And so it did. Over the years, several major updates and patches, the game is now a behemoth in the industry and has shown that free-to-play games can compete in the market without having to be scummy cash grabs. To this day, Warframe has left a huge impact on the gaming world. Say what you want about Warframe, but it has redefined free-to-play. Okay, Excalibur Prime section is over. We good? Good. Now, back to Excalibur's updates. Update 15 finally saw the introduction of Augment mods for Warframes, mods that can alter the effects and capabilities of Warframe powers, and Excalibur was no exception. Excalibur received the infamous Furious Javelin, which I will go into detail in a bit. Excalibur also received a new buff to his Super Jump, but got some nerfs to Radial Blind. Radial Javelin also got a mini rework, and all enemies within the radius will now be struck with a Javelin instead of having the ability emit from Excalibur himself. The Javelins will now find enemies as best as it can, but also the biggest change is that Javelins will try to strike the most enemies in an area. And another nice addition was enemies who did not die from Javelins will be stunned for a brief period of time. Because of this Radial Javelin rework, Excalibur rose to prominence. This build is mainly used on the new Draco to farm things such as XP, Syndicate Rep, and Focus. Let's talk a little more in depth about the ability. Excalibur will summon up to 12 Javelins that will seek out enemies within a radius of 25 meters. Once the Javelins come into contact with the enemies, they will proceed to do 1000 damage, which is evenly split between the 3 main damage types, Impact, Puncture, and Slash. The damage of the ability is affected by Pyro Strength, and the range of the ability is affected by Pyro Range. Now obviously this was nothing new. Mag and Banshee could do the same thing. But Excalibur was not limited to low-level enemies or Corpus and Void maps. Excalibur became super powerful and became one of the best Warframes in the game for the DPS meta. Excalibur quickly became one of the top Warframes for Draco series, which was, at the time, the most played level in the entire game. Radial Javelin was everywhere, and even after the Line of Sight nerf it got, Excalibur still destroyed the DPS meta and became mega strong for many setups and it was all thanks to this Radial Javelin rework. Radial Javelin also had a crazy bug where if you're playing as Excalibur as a client in squads, Radial Javelin would do two times the damage. Excalibur a little later on received more augments for Slash Dash and Radiant Finish. Radiant Finish itself was pretty decent for high level survivals, but it still didn't outclass Radial Javelin as that became Excalibur's most popular playstyle. Until... Update 16.9 Exalted Blade is a devastating weapon. Every swing of your blade delivers a deadly wave of energy hitting anyone in its path. It's damage enhanced by your melee weapon. Excalibur received his very first rework. Now, all of a sudden, in just one update, Excalibur went from a niche general Warframe who was very strong in DPS setups for one ability to an all-around amazing Warframe 
who can still DPS in setups. But most importantly, Excalibur set a new precedent in Warframe. It was possible to go and rework and redefine Warframes. Up until this point, many updates and reworks were really minor. There was no gameplay and ability overhauls. Excalibur changed that, and Excalibur Revisited set a new standard for reworks from this point forward. So, uh, Excal was a C, and I said in that last video that he was about to get a rework, and that my grade was just kind of there as the current grade. So Excal got his rework. Yes, he did. Uh, Excal is an A rank frame now. In fact, he's an A+. Excal is amazing. Exalted Blade is incredibly powerful, combined with Radial Blind, which is also crowd control. He's got a meta position on Draco, which is great. His one is still good. In fact, it's even better than it was before. You still gain the invincibility, but you can do a lot of damage with it. He's just really good. He's just like, he helps the team, albeit somewhat minorly, and is just a yeah, it's just a good frame. He's just really good. An outstanding frame. Completely outstanding. Uh, probably probably the best rework we've had to date. Uh, Excal is incredibly strong and is amazing starter choice. Fantastic. Absolutely wonderful. Slash Dash got an entire rework. It now targets enemies within a conal distance from Excalibur, targeting all enemies within range. Enemies hit by Slash Dash will count towards a melee combo counter, although this would become more useful with the introduction of body count. Radio Blind stayed the same, but this time you can perform full finishers on blinded enemies. Super Jump was fully removed from the game, and Radio Javelin became his third ability. And lastly, Exalted Blade became Excalibur's new ultimate ability. Excalibur summons a sword of pure light and immense power. Excalibur's armor was also increased, as well as a prime. Exalted Blade broke the game. It quickly became the strongest melee in the entire game. Exalted Blade was so powerful in fact that it scaled with melee mods as well as it having no damage falloff, meaning blades that are as far away as 20 meters would still deal maximum damage. Exalted Blade also got a new addition in the form of a mini pulse blind, so on slide attacks with the Exalted Blade, Excalibur would blind enemies and this costed zero energy to perform. Exalted Blade also pierced right through nullifier bubbles. Because of this rework, Excalibur easily became the best starter and one of the best warframes in the entire game. But like all good things in life, the good didn't last. During update 18.13, Excalibur finally got his Exalted Blade nerfed. The blade's damage now diminishes according to the distance traveled and enemies punctured. So blades that traveled further and hit more enemies will do less damage. And the biggest nerf was to Exalted Blind. Slide attacks now cost one half of the energy of a regular Radial Blind. These nerfs did bring Excalibur back in line, but the Radial Blind nerf was just a bit too much. Still, Excalibur remained amazing and easily a top tier frame regardless. Update 20.7 finally saw an augment release for Exalted Blade, and Excalibur once again became top tier and broke the melee meta, as Exalted Blade now did crazy elemental damage, and to this day, Chromatic Blade remains one of the strongest buffs to any melee weapon in the game alongside Reactive Storm. And making him stronger is probably a good thing as not many people really play as Excalibur that much anymore. So I was glad to see this come in and it's added a whole new concept to Excalibur where you have to mod him weirdly just to make this thing fit. Update 22.8.3 also saw Excalibur becoming easier to obtain for new players who did not choose Excalibur as the first starter. So now Excalibur can be obtained on the Mars boss instead of Pluto. And finally, the big one. With the introduction of Excalibur Umbra in Update 23.0, Exalted Blade got even stronger as you can now mod it directly with mods. With the introduction of Sacrificial Steel and Pressure, Exalted Blade also got a crazy buff. But the biggest buff of them all was the introduction of Excalibur Umbra. Now up until this point, Excalibur remained the only Warframe in the game that did not get his Prime variant public. Every other prime was obtainable. If you are not a founder, you were simply stuck with basic Excalibur. 
Now, I'm not going to dive into Umbra as he's got a lot of history and backstory behind him, and this video is mainly about basic Excalibur. I mean, I don't want to make this video even longer than it already is, but Umbra became the upgrade to basic Excalibur and an upgrade for players who do not own the Prime version. But don't worry, Umbra will have his own video eventually later down the line, because there is a lot to talk about, especially with the Chinese versions of the game and his weapons, the Spyro Prime and Nakana Prime. But anyways, back to basic Excalibur. Exalted Blade got juicy buffs, and you can now mod it directly, giving it even more damage alongside Chromatic Blade. You can also now distribute higher slash to the blade, which was also nice. Now after this point, over the years, Excalibur simply received fixes and tweaks to mods and abilities, but nothing game-defining until the deadlocked protocol. This update introduced a new character into the story, as well as reworking the oldest tile set in the game, the Corpus ship maps. But there was one main problem that started to surface with Excalibur and other Exalted-based melee frames. They could not use Acolyte mods. You see, when Operation Shadow Debt went live, that update introduced red crits to melees because of Blood Rush and Body Count. These mods allowed melee weapons to now red crit, which boosted every melee in the game. Suddenly, so many melees became super meta, and eventually the game went into the melee meta with Maiming Strike and Blood Rush. This meta was... Very toxic, as players would make macros and spam Adrax or Skoliax with Blood Rush Maiming Strike, and because of the high ass range and punch through with melees, people were nuking the entire map while spinning like a Beyblade. But because of the introduction of these Acolyte mods, Exalted Blade became less powerful despite having Chromatic Blade, because you couldn't make Blood Rush and Body Count work. I mean, nowadays you can with statistics, but back then this was not possible as Exalted Blade can't use Acolyte mods. There was a lot of discussion about Exalted Blade needing Blood Rush to compete with normal melees, but this idea went on deaf ears as DE did not allow Exalted melees to use Acolyte mods. So for a while, Excalibur was just limited in terms of how you can mod Exalted Blade. However, with the introduction of the Zoras, this changed everything, because now you can keep combo counter for Exalted melees. Now, the Zoras allowed players to maintain combo stack effectively giving Exalted weapons an astronomical damage bonus because the melee combo counter wouldn't dissipate. And unfortunately, with everything nice, DE ended up nerfing this, so now Exalted weapons will reset the melee combo counter if the Zoras is being used. Yeah, that was kind of a stinker. And unfortunately, Excalibur just kind of sat there for a while. He was good, don't get me wrong, but he didn't get any updates or buffs for a while. It wasn't until the holy update that was Veilbreaker where we saw our poster boy get some much needed love. Excalibur now has his slash dash reworked, so Excalibur now blinks to each target creating an after image upon each slash. The damage is also finally now 100% slash since yeah it wasn't 100% slash back then. Kind of awkward. And the speed between each dash has been increased. Radial Javelin also got a mega strong buff. There is no longer a cap, so all enemies that are in range of Excalibur will be hit by a Javelin, which also indirectly buffed Furious Javelin, as there's now no longer a cap for that augment. It also gave a guaranteed slash effect to Radial Javelin. Now these changes might seem minor on paper, but in reality they give Excalibur a much needed boost to his performance and DPS. Surging Dash became even stronger, I mean, it was strong before the melee builds in general, but now it's even better and Slash Dash in general became more fluid to use. Remember, Slash Dash also gives Excalibur invulnerability until the animation is finished. And the Radial Javelin change was perfect as Furious Javelin can now scale even higher, so melee builds were at an all-time high for Excalibur. I also forgot to mention the subsume system, but it did improve Excalibur's use as you can now replace whatever ability you didn't like for something stronger, and this did improve his total damage and versatility, thankfully. But yeah, outside of that, here we are today. So with all that said and done, let's talk about the current Excalibur in 2023. Excalibur has improved mastery in the Tenno Art of the Blade, receiving a 10% boost to attack speed and damage for specific melee weapons. These weapons include single swords like the Skana, dual swords like the Dual Carries, all Nakanas, rapiers like the Destrasia, and his Exalted Blade. The boost stacks additively with mods like Fury and Pressure Point. A very simple passive, but unfortunately does not work with all melee types. 
still it's a simple passive that gets the job done and boosts his own kit. Excalibur's first ability is Slash Dash. What the hell, Slash Dash? Who the hell names a power Slash Dash? Anyways, Slash Dash lets Excalibur lunge forward in a burst of momentum to cut down mobs with his exalted blade. If enemies are nearby, Excalibur will auto-chain to them until all enemies within the cone are hit. The base damage is 100% Slash. I mean, thankfully so. Cone length and dash velocity are affected by ability range. Slash Dash is also affected by Aim Glide. Slash Dash can also be affected by momentum, but will not change momentum outside of its animation. Thus, whichever way you were going before you cast Slash Dash, you will continue to go unless stopped by other means at the same speed. This will affect how far your dash will go when not targeted. As Slash Dash base critical chance and status chance are 0%, Slash Dash cannot deal critical hits or status effects without flat bonuses to either metric. Chained Slash Dash can also be cancelled by jumping or rolling. The damage is also affected by ability strength, the melee combo counter, and some mods. Slash Dash itself also gains 25% additional damage for each combo multiplier, up to a 3.7 times damage multiplier at 12 times combo, or an astronomical 4 times with Venka Prime equipped at 13 combo. The mod stats that can affect Slash Dash include damage mods like Steel Charge, physical mods like Jagged Edge, elemental mods like Molten Impact, and weapon augments like Justice Blades. If the player wields any of the melees that are boosted by Excalibur's passive, Slash Dash will also receive the 10% bonus as well. Slash Dash is also not affected by melee weapon stats and innate effects, or conditional mods like Conditioned Overload or Acolyte mods. The only exception to this is the Venka Prime. However, what's really cool about Slash Dash is that you can further boost its damage by activating Exalted Blade. Slash Dash's damage, however, is not affected by Chromatic Blade, and the Cone Length is not affected by Reach. Enemies damaged by Slash Dash suffer a knockdown unless immune to knockdowns or statuses. Every instance of damage adds to the melee combo counter, regardless of the amount of enemies hit or if Excalibur physically made contact with a target. Excalibur also has invulnerability to damage during Slash Dash. Shields will still take damage, however, and energy draining effects can still be applied to Excalibur, such as Ancient Disruptors. You can also target airborne enemies, but you'll have to aim glide then cast Slash Dash to actually hit them. If there are, however, no enemies within range, Slash Dash will make Excalibur dash forward in the direction of aim, allowing it to be used as a pretty good mobility ability in large areas. Slash Dash will also give Exalted Blade combo count per enemy hit, which gives some nice synergy with his augment so you can really build up combo very fast. Exalted Blade will also launch out an Energy Blade when enemies are struck by Slash Dash, which further increases Excalibur's DPS. The waves, however, will behave the same as it does from normal strikes of Exalted Blade. Slash Dash can also trigger Warframe Arcanes. Okay, that was only his first ability. Are you still with me? Good. Slash Dash also has two augments. Purging Dash lets you cleanse status effects, although Rolling Guard can kind of do the same thing, so there isn't a whole lot of value Purging Dash can offer. But Surging Dash, on the other hand, is a very, very strong mod as you can easily build up combo count with just a few casts as the mod scales with ability strength. So if you find yourself having a hard time building up combo a lot, you can use this mod. Plus, it has some wicked synergies with a lot of heavy attack setups. Thankfully, Excalibur's second ability is much more simpler, Radial Blind. What more is there to say, really? You blind enemies. That's basically it. Excalibur emits a bright light from his blade, releasing an intense flash that affects enemies within Excalibur's line of sight. Duration affects the blind timer and range affects the radius. Blinded enemies are also weak to finishers and are susceptible to stealth damage bonus from melees. Radial Blind, however, will not affect enemies behind walls, obstacles, or covers. This ability is also Excalibur Subzoom, so every frame in the game can use Radial Blind as well as Radiant Finish, which is the augment. Radiant Finish also gives Excalibur or the caster a 300% damage bonus to mobs who are affected by Radial Blind. This augment is honestly really good with Ash as you can boost the damage multiplier with strength. Banshee can also double stack this, or Excalibur, with her Savage Silence pairing for some insanely high finisher damage. But outside of that, that's it. It's an all around good ability for most frames, and Banshee and Excalibur can intertwine their subzoom, making the most use of this augment. Excalibur's third ability is Radial Javelin. Excalibur summons javelins against enemies within a radius of 25 meters. Excalibur then drives his weapon into the ground, launching the javelins into their targets, inflicting damage with a guaranteed slash proc and also staggering enemies. The damage is evenly distributed between impact, puncture, and slash. 
The damage is also affected by ability strength. Enemies that survive the damage are temporarily stunned. Radius is also affected by ability range. While javelins do not punch through objects or enemies, their striking position is optimized to ensure a successful hit on their targets when they spawn. This allows the javelins to bypass obstacles in the environment including walls, cover, and grenier shield lancer shields. Radial javelin, however, will not target enemies behind obstacles in the environment unless Excalibur has a line of sight or unless the enemy is aware of Excalibur within a short period of time. Each javelin also appears as an ethereal Skana, and Excalibur Prime and Excalibur Umbra's javelins appear as an ethereal Skana Prime. The ability also has a cast time of 1 second and a post-cast animation delay of 2.5 seconds which can be changed through means like Archon Shards or Natural Talent. Now, Radial Javelin on its own is pretty decent, but with the Augment Furious Javelin, it cranks this ability up to an 11, and with the mob cap now fully removed, Excalibur can further boost his melee damage to ridiculous levels, because this boosts Excalibur's Exalted Blade as well. There are so many crazy strong steel path builds for this, and the one you see on screen is from... Kebra de Bois. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Link will be in the description and comment, so do check it out. And on its own for just DPS, Furious Javelin can really boost the new capabilities of Excalibur as having that insane damage boost is always valuable. The damage boost is also multiplicative like Eclipse. Also, just the animation itself is really cool. Excalibur slams the ground with immense force, creating javelins that pierce enemies in their chest as they get flung into the nearest wall on death. Just amazing. And lastly, Excalibur's ultimate... Oh dear god. Okay, let's do this. Excalibur draws an ethereal scan on the Exalted Blade and wields it as his Exalted melee weapon. Normal attacks inflict damage within 2 meters. The damage is distributed between 15% impact, 15% puncture, and 70% slash. Wall attacks inflict damage and slide attacks inflict damage and blind enemies within 5 meters over a duration of 6 seconds at the cost of 25 energy. The blind duration and range are affected by ability duration and ability range respectively. Aerial and slam attacks also inflict damage, however slam attacks inflict an additional 50 impact damage within 5 meters. Normal slide and aerial attacks will emit an energy wave in the direction of aim. Energy waves have the same base damage as attacks and release them and fly at a constant speed of 15 meters per second until they dissipate after 2.5 seconds, which corresponds to a maximum distance of 37.5 meters. The energy waves and Exalted Blade itself are considered separate entities and will deal damage separately, which means if you strike an enemy with the Exalted Blade directly, they take a second instance of damage from the energy wave at the same time. Energy waves will punch through and hit enemies and terrain regardless of thickness up to their maximum range. Energy wave lifetime decreases by 0.5 seconds by 7.5 meters for every enemy hit from the max lifetime of 2.5 seconds, which is 37.5 meters. Wave damage falls off linearly with distance from 100% to 85% between 0 and 6.5 meters and 28% to 0% between 6.5 meters and 37.5 meters. Wave range damage fall off and flight speed are not affected by mods, but the flight speed is affected by Zephyr's Jetstream mod. Enemies hit by the waves will also suffer a stagger. Attacks and energy waves have a 200% critical multiplier with a 15% crit chance and a 15% status chance that's all moddable and affected by Archon Shards. The damage itself is also affected by ability strength, most mods, and buffs, but not the melee combo counter. Being a single-handed sword, Exalted Blade will always gain the 10% damage and attack speed bonuses of Excalibur Swordsmanship passive. The mods that can be equipped on an affected Exalted Blade include Damage Mods, Physical Damage Mods, Elemental Mods, Faction Mods, Crit Chance and Crit Damage Mods, Status Chance Mods, Status Duration Mods, Attack Speed Mods, Condition Overload, Drifting Contact, Healing Return, Relentless Combination, Shattering Impact, and Enduring Affliction. Also to note that apart from Physical Damage Mods and Shattering Impact Mods, all mods will still affect the Exalted Blade when Chromatic Blade is equipped. While officially set mod bonuses do not affect exalted weapons, with the exception of sacrificial mod set, the gladiator mod set can still apply if equipped on melee and not the exalted weapon itself, thus giving Excalibur a pseudo-ish stat stick. Each direct melee attack also adds to the combo counter, while the energy waves and radial damage from slam attacks do not. Slash status effects generated from the waves while relentless combination is equipped will grant combo counts to the exalted blade. The Exalted Blade, however, cannot be equipped with weapon augments like Justice Blades or weapon-specific mods like Covert Lethality and Melee Combo Count mods, except Drifting Contact, and it also can't use Acolyte mods like Blood Rush or Amalgam mods like Amalgam Organ Shatter. 
Riven mods are also not generated for Exalted Blade. The combo counter will reset when equipped with Sauris, and the Exalted Blade's combo counter decay is affected by Power Spike. Radial damage from slam attacks diminishes with distance and does not have a critical chance and is not affected by the melee combo counter and will cause enemies within range to suffer a knockdown. Ground finishers inflict 400% of the total modified damage from normal attacks and prompted finishers inflict 3,200% of the total modified damage from normal attacks as true damage. Exalted Blade consumes 2.5 energy per second while active and will remain active until energy is depleted or the ability is deactivated by pressing the ability key again. The activation, energy cost, and built-in radial blind cost are affected by ability efficiency and the energy drain is affected by ability efficiency and ability duration. Exalted Blade's energy drain does not convert into shields by Augur mods. Excalibur also cannot replenish energy using Energy Vampire, Rally Point, Rift Plane's innate energy regeneration, squad energy restores, energy siphon or wellspring while the blade is active. However, energy orbs, orc and void death orbs, rage, hunter adrenaline, spellbound harvest, arcane energize and emergence dissipate can still replenish the blade's energy. Exalted blade is affected by and can trigger warframe arcanes, however it cannot trigger exodia arcanes. Exalted blade will also use an exclusive stance with its own set of combo attacks. Slash Dash will also receive a 10% bonus to its base damage from Excalibur's Swordsmanship passive, and each enemy hit will release an energy wave when Exalted Blade is active. Slash Dash hits add to Exalted Blade's combo counter as well, and energy waves will behave identically to those of Exalted Blade. The energy waves and Exalted Blade are considered separate entities and will deal damage separately. Waves will strike both the targeted enemy and all enemies behind it. Waves are also affected by mods on both the quote melee weapon and on Exalted Blade. The energy waves are also able to deal critical hits and status effects. The crit and status performances are also affected by critical chance and damage mods and status chance mods and chromatic blade. And dear lord, chromatic blade. Chromatic blade works identical to chroma's passive, so depending on the energy color of your emissive energy, it can change the chromatic blade's damage type. Chromatic Blade will also replace IPS of Exalted Blade. And on the topic of IPS, I did state that Shock Trooper removes IPS, but this is not the case. Very sorry about that. It simply adds electric to your DPS. Chromatic Blade is also affected by power strength, and with high strength, you can get a very high status chance. And to achieve 100% status chance, you must have up to 189% strength. Now, to keep Exalted Blade extremely simple, Excalibur puts on Chromatic Blade, Excalibur uses Exalted Blade, Excalibur does a lot of damage. That was a doozy. But for real, Chromatic Blade does boost the DPS by a significant amount, and is great for any primer builds as you can get a ton of status effects on enemies and slice them down. The DPS can also be further boosted by Furious Javelin as well, so for endgame setups, Chromatic Blade is great. However, if you are trying a Viral Slash setup, you do not want to use this augment as it will remove the IPS of Exalted Blade. And that's that. Excalibur, the poster boy of Warframe. The very first. And the face of the game. Overall, I feel like Excalibur is in a good spot. He's not overtly broken unless you spec in a huge investment, and rightfully so. His abilities are all great and have great synergies between them. His Exalted Blade is cool and redefined the way we look at Warframe reworks, and... Well, he's just really cool. I mean, who doesn't like Excalibur? His design is so iconic. He is the Swordsman of Warframe, and without Excalibur, Warframe wouldn't even be Warframe. It's hard to imagine anyone else taking up the mantle and role, and Excalibur being the face of Warframe is something we can't deny. Ever since the very first vanilla, Excalibur has always been there. Through tough times and the good times, Excalibur has been there. And it's crazy to imagine that Excalibur is turning 10 this year. Time sure does fly. And chances are you probably do have Excalibur and Umbra, unless you chose Volter Mag. But even though this video isn't about Umbra, I suggest giving Excalibur a second shot. Maybe this video will change your mind about him. And as for the rest of us, let's celebrate 2023 with a bang. I suggest you pick up Excalibur again and give him another shot this year. Who knows, maybe you might rekindle your love with Excalibur and Warframe. I know I sure did. Anyways, that's gonna be it for me. If you enjoyed this video, then please do hit that like button and subscribe. Your support is greatly appreciated. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you guys next time. Peace.